think the entire wider context of my discussion may be introduced by saying that, let's say, um, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, if one sort of would have taken a, a poll of sorts among people in Western culture as to what they thought about the figure of the um, founder of the Christian tradition, I think the views would have polarized around two um, particular um, ways of looking at this figure. And on the one side, we would have had, even as we do have now, sort of the established theological views with all the uh, formulations that people have come up with over the centuries, the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world, so and so forth, you know, a very strictly defined and organized, but perhaps not all that well understood kind of an ideology. On the other hand, we would have had the um, so-called liberal theological views which have been gaining influence ever since the uh, 19th century, And there uh, we probably would have found a lot of people who um, in uh, supportive surroundings would have admitted, well, as far as we can tell, you know, this seems to have been a a nice Jewish teacher, a little rabbi from the countryside who was a very good man, who didn't like a lot of the uh, injustice and a lot of the... um, the wrong-headedness that was going on in that particular culture, who spoke up against it, and who eventually, by the political forces, was put to death. And then, somehow, um, as time went on, other people um, came along, so they would have said, particularly the one blamed for that being the Apostle Paul, who, rather on the example of the uh, Greek or Roman religious mythology turned him into a god. And that was probably not right. It was not true that it was something that he probably himself would have disapproved of. And that's kind of where it stands. Without casting aspersions on anyone, a sort of a Unitarian point of view. And of course I have a lot of Unitarian jokes, some of which I have told in Unitarian churches when I was speaking, the best of which is the one which you probably heard me tell more than once, what do you get when you cross a Unitarian with a Jehovah's Witness? You uh, get someone who will ring your doorbell for no particular reason. (laughs) And then there are some others which are... uh, uh, The jokes go downhill from there. This is the best one. (laughs) So... um, Now, even though a lot of people don't seem to realize that, on either side of the issue, on these two sides that I just outlined, something has happened that places this issue into an entirely different perspective. And that something is the uh, discovery and the translation and a certain amount of exegesis of the Naj Hammadi Gnostic Library. And what has happened was that documents were discovered, some of which at least, particularly the Gospel of Thomas, according to uh, very reputable scholarly opinions, go back to extremely early sources, in all likelihood clear back into the first century. So when the Gospel of Thomas was written down, the uh, likelihood is that there were still some people walking around maybe the very ones who did the writing, who were there when Jesus was alive and who probably had some contact with him. So these are extremely authoritative documents. And what do they reveal? They reveal a uh, view largely on the basis of what would appear to be a self-revelation of Jesus himself, because the Gospel of Thomas consists entirely of sayings attributed to him, a view which does not agree either with the um, mainstream theological positions nor with the so-called liberal position that I just outlined, but is entirely different, entirely different. And I think that for this reason it is fairly important that we take a look at the figure of Jesus, both in terms of how the uh, image 
the generally accepted image of this person changed throughout history, and I will do that first, and then also to gain an impression, and that will be woven into the material, as to what this early view really represented. And I, I'll do that mostly toward the end of the talk, but also a certain amount in the beginning. Now, of course, it goes without saying that with all of these changing views, the founder of the Christian tradition was and remains an enigma of history and of the culture. His appearance was instrumental in bringing not only a new religion into the world, which in itself wasn't such a big deal because those things keep happening, but not only brought a new religion into the world, but a religion that became the most aggressive and successful missionary religion of known human history. It may be, it may be supplanted by Islam in that regard as time goes on, but so far up to this point. But a religion that spread to every continent of the globe and became a factor that no statesman or historian or a student of culture can leave out of his calculations. At the same time, the figure of Jesus also became the sort of the supreme watershed, the great divide, separating the three leaves of the Mediterranean clover of the monotheistic religions of Jews, Christians and Muslims, and in many ways setting them against each other, possibly for all eternity. The reason for that being that Christians regard Jesus, again, on the whole, as an embodiment of God. The Jews regard him at best as a righteous but misunderstood Jew, and at worst as a um, disreputable heretic while the Muslims revere him as a great and saintly prophet whom the Christians blasphemously elevated to divinity. And how that came about we shall also see shortly. So countless, countless good things, countless benefactions, innumerable acts of love and grace have been performed in his name but also bloody and unjustified wars, as well as the murder of so-called heretics and dissidents, were perpetrated in his name also. Goodness and evil, high culture and low fanaticism, magnificent art and tawdry counterfeit piety, and much, much more are associated with his name. See, for better or for worse, our culture and indeed the entire world has not been the same for almost 2,000 years, and the cause of this was this mysterious, unconventional religious teacher raised in Nazareth and executed in Jerusalem. I never um, miss an opportunity, whether it fits my context or not, to point out that important things always happen in the cities. People may be born in a manger in Bethlehem, you know, and as somebody said, what could has ever come out of Nazareth, you know? <laughs> um, but where the work is done is somehow always in the city. So keep that in mind if you are, have any ideas about moving to Podunk or um, Eastern Oregon. Nothing important really happens out in the country. Now, um, let me also um, throw in, as I like to, a um, quotation from Carl Jung, which in a certain way, uh, I think, characterizes or describes my position also. Carl Jung wrote, I am not addressing myself to the happy possessors of faith, but to the many people for whom the light has gone out, the mystery has faded and God is dead. He said this incidentally on, probably on the basis of Nietzsche's earlier pronouncement and not the pronouncement in the 1960s of the, um, the God is dead theologians like Thomas Altheiser and people like that. That also brings up a, a very ancient joke that most of you have heard is that in a, some class in religion or somewhere a 
student or the teacher probably wrote on the blackboard, God is dead, signed Nietzsche, and left it there. You know? And by the time the class convened again, there was an other sentence underneath it saying, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. <laughs> 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 so... Uh, <laughs> um, in any event, for those who God is dead, for most of them there is no going back. And one does not know either whether going back is always the better way. To gain an understanding of religious matters, said Jung, probably all that is left us today is the psychological approach. That is why, again, he said of himself, I take these thought forms that have become historically fixed try to melt them down again and pour them into molds of immediate experience. As we will see, that is a position that did not originate with Jung, and if we cannot say that it entirely in all history originated with the Gnostics, it certainly was powerfully represented by the Gnostics. Speaking for myself, um, I also, very much like Jung, have felt from early childhood that there is something wrong with the figure of Jesus as presented to us by religious tradition. It was not until I came in contact with the Gnostic teachings that I discovered that the figure of Jesus prevalent in modern Christianity is certainly not the only one, and there are indeed many different characterizations of this figure throughout history, which which differ sharply one from the other. Now, what I am going to say now for a few minutes is very largely based on the Gnostic scriptures, but I will come back to it in a more specific way later on. We know now that the Jesus of the Gnostics, and by extension, to some extent and degree, it would seem, the Jesus of the entirety of the Christian communities, of the first few centuries, certainly three, maybe even more than that, was a total enigma, an almost insoluble and indeed insoluble mystery. In some of the scriptures he is represented as a man, in some he is represented as the divine Anthropos, the wisdom man who had come from afar to rescue the sparks of light that have fallen into the darkness. At times he had a body and a human voice wherewith he uttered many wise sayings. At other times it would appear, according to these reports, that he had a phantom body only, which only seemed to be like any other. Certainly um, reports of someone walking on water, of someone walking through closed doors, walking through walls, changing his appearance in all kinds of ways, do not indicate the kind of things that a regular human being with a, an unchanging, at least momentarily unchanging, solid body would do. Like the trickster god of the American Indians or, or the fool of the tarot card cards, he was everywhere and everything. He was in a body and without it, in the world and outside of it. As a Gnostic scripture, not of the Nach Hammadi collection, incidentally known as the Odes of Solomon, makes him say, I seem to them like a stranger, because I am from an other race. The other race here being other than the human race. He also is made to say that he is the all, and from him the all came forth. He is a mysterious being, total and all-encompassing. Certainly so said the Gnostics, and their views were um, at least in part shared by many others who would not have been called Gnostics in their times. So such was the figure of Jesus for the first three or four centuries all-inclusive, mysterious, ubiquitous. When St. Paul the Apostle said of himself that he was all things to all men, he was perhaps consciously or unconsciously engaging in a bit of imitatio Christi, imitation of Christ. Then the changes began to manifest. 
In the catacombs, we still find a very universal, a very Gnostic Jesus. He is depicted as a form of Bacchus, holding a staff with grapes and surrounded by vines. He is depicted as a shepherd carrying a lamb on his shoulders. He is also, most incomprehensible perhaps to the rational mind, the mysterious Ictos, the fish, for which no biblical justification can be found, as one might allege in the case of the Good Shepherd and the vine and the branches of the grape plant. Beginning in the 3rd, 4th and 5th centuries, this mythos of unceasing, overflowing creativity becomes confined increasingly within dogmatic formulations. Perhaps a landmark among these formulations is the one reached at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, that puts it in 5th century, where the great argument which still goes on, was it human, was it divine, was resolved in the following manner. The Church Fathers declared as a dogma, an article of belief, that Jesus was the union of two substances, of divinity and humanity, that he was perfect God of the substance of the Father and perfect man of the substance of the Virgin Mary, his mother. You see... um, People um, have a great desire to resolve difficulties, but that doesn't mean that that desire always brings about truly, ultimately satisfactory results. This was one of them. We thought, well, there is this argument going on, we'll fix it this way. He was both. The Church Fathers here tried to rationally define what previously was dealt with on a non-rational level, as a non-rational kind of realization, and their attempt in this matter inevitably ended in, uh, well, I would call it in failure. From then on, the figure of Jesus underwent first a gradual and then an ever more rapid deterioration. In the dazzling mosaics of the Byzantine Empire, as still visible in Ravenna and in Constantinople, Jesus continues as a superhuman being of cosmic dimensions. The all-ruling Pantocrator with orb and scepter, the universal ruler. He is still there as the representative, really, of the holy order, of the principle of cosmic rulership. But somehow the creative unity has gone. The chalice of the Eucharist no longer can be said to overflow with creative power as it did in the early centuries. Something is still there, but something also has been lost. This particular page of my notes was written some years ago, but if I had written it now, it would in part describe my impressions of Christian Rome. Something is still there, but something also has been lost. Something even has been lost since 1949 when I last walked those streets. At least that is my impression. You don't have to believe me. Um, um, But far be it from me to say that there isn't something there. Then come the long, dark Middle Ages with the still very non-human figure of Jesus, austere, regal, sometimes agonizing on the cross, but still capable of repeating, although perhaps with less conviction, the Gnostic statement, I am from an other race. The process goes on, history proceeds, and we arrive at the Renaissance, where in accordance with the principles of humanism, Jesus becomes very human in appearance. He becomes the perfect man, the model for the anatomical perfection of the human being. And certainly you can see this in all the Renaissance art, which is all over Rome and many other places. The anatomical perfection of the human body, a classical hero god with vaguely messianic overtones. The perfect god has given way to the perfect man. The divine king is now the perfectly proportioned human body. The dictate of the Council of Chalcedon has been fulfilled. 
he who was declared both perfect God and perfect man, has been now experienced on the both aspects, but somehow something has been lost. After the Renaissance, there comes the great decline that begins with the Reformation and ends in the soulless materialism of the late 19th and the 20th century. Luther detests the pagan beauty of the Renaissance Christ. In his desperate attempt to oppose the so-called paganism of Renaissance Rome, he manages to degrade and downgrade the figure still more. He boasts that Jesus dirtied his diapers like other human infants, thereby giving Freudian psychologists a fine excuse to invade the field of religion with the vital and sublime issue of toilet training. Luther wants to make Jesus real and relevant, but instead of this, he merely begins the great historical movement that will make him banal and irrelevant. The other great reformers, particularly the austere and guilt-ridden John Calvin and his fanatical ranting disciple John Knox, leave Jesus more and more out of their calculations and worship a Christianized form of the Old Testament Godhead instead. It is this vengeful and cruel archetype that becomes the God of the Puritans, the Lord eventually also of the Industrial Revolution, of the wool merchants of Manchester and of the Yankee traders of New England. The concept of the Old Testament Israel is replaced now by the chosen people of the successful, the industrious, the rich. Calvinist predestination comes to declare that the Puritan God loves the rich more than the poor, and that wealth and success are signs of divine favor. Jesus, well, he is still there, but he has been dethroned. The 17th and the 18th century uses him as a sentimental object of maudlin devotion and little more. These are the kind of things of the Jansenists and the worship of the sacred heart on the part of the Jesuits and everything a very emotional attempt to recapture something, to go to the heart of the matter. But, again, it doesn't really work. He becomes a sentimental comforter, a friend on whose shoulder the bereaved are supposed to cry, and the downtrodden hope, but still never quite receive total consolation. What a friend we have in Jesus, and he walks with me and he talks with me. What a far cry this pale, sentimentalized figure is from the majestic king of the Byzantine basilicas, not to speak of the well of the living waters that flowed from the mystic and Gnostic Christ figure of the first centuries. Now we come to what may appear to be the end of the line, the bottom of the abyss, what nowadays they might call the bottom line, the nethermost circle of the inferno of history. Rationalism becomes the deity of the 18th and 19th centuries. Voltaire, Rousseau and their fellows begin the cult of reason, and soon the heads roll under the blade of the guillotine, while Robespierre and other rationalists enthrone a prostitute on the altar of the Republic in Notre Dame Cathedral, incidentally, which they requisitioned for the purpose, and proclaim her the goddess of reason. God is dead, long live reason. And reason triumphant rides her chariot into the 19th century, but her apostles are no longer philosophers and idealists like the bewigged and powdered encyclopedists of the 18th century. Charles Darwin, Ernst Haeckel and their fellows extend the venomous sword of reason into the process of life and discover no God and no Savior there, only blind force and the survival of the fittest. The 19th century also looks at Jesus and with its rationalism discovers that as a figure of physical history, he can hardly be said to exist. Now, the rationalism comes to the point where they begin to deny the historicity. 
Renan, Legge, Guignobert and countless others, including even Albert Schweitzer, declare that the quest for the historical Jesus leads nowhere. More insightful researchers, however, begin to recognize that this absence of historicity brings with it possibilities hitherto undreamt of because forbidden, namely that Jesus is a prototype or archetype rather than a figure of physical history. So the historical Jesus gives way to the Jesus of myth, and scholarship recognizes that the figure of the crucified Nazarene embodies innumerable savior gods of antiquity, Osiris, Horus, Tammuz, Mitra, Orpheus, and many others. It would appear that with the advent of the 20th century, Western civilizations and culture has fallen so low spiritually that there is only one way, namely up, or a total fall into the abyss, <coughs> whichever way it may go. The cycle is nearing its end, confusion reigns, and in this confusion some voices appear to herald the new dawn while others still grope and stumble about in the darkness of the night. And thus, over the last oh, 25 years, we are confronted with many signs of this confusion, and nowhere are these signs more evident than in the bewildering number of characterizations of Jesus today. On the level of entertainment, in the sort of in the 60s, 60s, 70s period, we had Jesus in God's in a play called God's Spell, appearing as an unreal and whimsical clown and in Jesus Christ Superstar as an abrasive social critic whom um, one wouldn't necessarily want to invite to dinner. In the world of scholarship, we have many new Jesuses. One of my favorites was, and on a somewhat comical level still is, the psychedelic phallic symbol of the great Dead Sea Scroll scholar John Allegro described in his work The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. Another was the erotic magician conjured up by the great biblical scholar Morton Smith in his books The Secret Gospel and Jesus the Magician. On the basis of a truly very important letter, brief letter of Clement of Alexandria to a certain Theodore, discovered in the early 1970s, I believe, in an old cave monastery. And we can go on from there, all kinds of them. The German scholar Johannes Lehmann, in his book Rabbi J, which created a great sensation in Europe, represents Jesus as a somewhat confused Jewish Essene rabbi, unjustly killed and buried in a cabbage patch. And Perhaps last, but certainly not least, while well, one could have a much longer list than that, there was the interesting Jesus of another fairly reputable scholar, gone popular with some of his books, Dr. Hugh Schoenfield, who portrayed him in his books The Passover Plot, Those Incredible Christians, and The Jesus Party, in which he largely spoke about an individual who deliberately went about fulfilling the prophecies in order to fit a certain <laughs> image of expectation. But now, um, before I come to the specifically Gnostic presentation, let me call your attention to what, which might or might not be a significant circumstance. One always has to phrase it a little bit that way. But look at how, in a certain way, things came really full circle. If my view is correct, in the very early Christian centuries, there's very little definition, and there is a strange transgressivity between history, mythology, mystical vision, imagination, and all sorts of things of that sort. So it's a, um, it's sort of a... Um, uh, a spiritual grab bag of archetypes. And depending on where you are in your own mind, you grab that one and hang on to it. And then, of course, as I went through, the, then it 
is made to crystallize, 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 come down more and more, more and more, more and more. And then it reaches rock bottom, and with the late 19th century, with the religious historical school, as it was called in Tübingen, you can see the leaders of, of it, C.F. Bauer and people like that. Dr. Robinson has all their pictures hung in the hallway in the Claremont Institute of Antiquity and Christianity. You know, these were the boys, really, to whom Jung was very much indebted and others, because they had gotten to the point on the basis of very serious scholarship, mind you, and higher biblical criticism and so forth, that they said, well, we have come to the end of the line with a historical and a sort of rationalistic approach. What this is, is primarily a myth. But they did not use the term myth as a synonym for falsehood. But they began to discover value once again in a non-historical, non-physical, mythic approach. What was that but the rediscovery of precisely at least one of the things that people did way back? Well, uh, you know, what was it? Maybe 1,600 years ago or so at the very beginning. So we had to come all the way around the circle to that. And then that went further and further, and then the historicity was denied more and more. They said Albert Schweitzer and people like that, quest for the historical Jesus, as I mentioned before. <coughs> But, you know, um, Albert Schweitzer could say that he couldn't find the historical Jesus anywhere. But uh, his work and his life was the most Christ-like, probably, of well, at least of a lot of people. So what was he basing that on? Well, he was basing it on some reality that was in Dr. Schweitzer's mind. You see, the, the reality could not be exercised by historical and biblical criticism and revisionism and things of that sort. There was some kind of reality still there. And I venture to suggest it was the very reality that was there at the beginning. But so we, we went through this, this incredible process. And at the, uh, um, du during the 20th century, we sort of, in, in an entirely different way, but worked our way back to a position, at least in part, that is not unlike the one of the very early centuries. And then, 1940, in the 1940s, middle 1940s, comes the Naj Hammadi discovery. Now let me, um, obviously the, cor the Naj Hammadi corpus is so vast and it's constantly concerned with the figure of Jesus, so there are only a, really a few things that we can pick out at this time. Let me read to you, first of all, something that many of you have read and heard us read at various times, the 13th Logion from the Gospel according to Thomas. Jesus said to his disciples, Make a comparison to me and tell me whom I am like. Simon Peter said to him, Thou art like a righteous angel. Matthew said to him, Thou art like a wise man of understanding. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth will not at all be capable of saying whom thou art like. And then Jesus said to him, I am not thy master, because thou hast become drunk from the bubbling spring which I have measured out. And he took him, that is, he took Thomas, he withdrew, he spoke three words to him. Now when Thomas came to his companions, they asked him, what did Jesus say to thee? Can't you just see them? Hey, hey what, 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 what was this all about, you know? What did he say to you? What did he say to me? You know, what did he say to you? Thomas said to them, If I tell you one of these words which he said to me, you will take up stones and throw them at me. And fire will come from the stones and burn you up. In other words, we'll both come to grief. I will come to grief because of the stones that will hit me, and you will come to grief because of what, what you're doing. Now, um, this is really a Gnostic version of a passage to be found in Matthew, 16th chapter, 13th verse, in fact, where Peter gives the reportedly right answer. Here we find that the Gnostic, such as Thomas, to the Gnostic, all definitions are inadequate. He says, I am not going to define you. 
I am not going to liken you to anyone. The text shows two apostles giving two extreme answers. Peter says that he is like a righteous angel. This is a supernatural view. Pure spirit. Because that's what angels are. And then Matthew, curiously the same apostle in whose gospel we find the, the other related account, gives voice to the opposite point of view. Thou art like a wise man of understanding. So here sort of Matthew is the Unitarian. <laughs> uh, Peter is on the totally spiritual line. Now, but there comes Thomas who cannot or will not say anything. Why? Well, I would suggest because he has experienced something. He has experienced what to him appeared to be the essence of this person. He has become a knower. On the basis of his experience, he knows him. And for this reason, Jesus says, I am no longer your master. Because something has happened to you. And he even uses the term, which undoubtedly uh, wouldn't be pleasing to some people, but it has to be recognized in its proper context. He says, you have drunk from the bubbling spring, I have measured out more than that. You have become drunk with it. What does that mean? It changed your consciousness. What I have measured out has changed your consciousness. And since your consciousness has changed in that way and to that extent, you now know something in your own right. And that is why I am no longer your master. Thomas has experienced ecstasy as the result of this contact with Jesus. Then in his ecstasy, he tells him, Jesus tells him a secret. And we don't know what it is because otherwise it wouldn't be a secret. <laughs> that may annoy us, <laughs> but that's how it is. We don't know the words. But we may suspect something, whether that suspicion would be correct or not. I will not speculate at this point. So here is the key. The real Gnostic, the real knower, must be drunk with the bubbling spring that the Logos has measured out. If you experience the intoxicating essence then you know. Otherwise, you just talk. Or maybe keep quiet, I don't know. But you don't know. And that, with all due respect, is really what the scholars do for the most part. Talk. And write. This is also, I think, the key to several conundrums. When 19th century comparative mythological scholarship, as I noted earlier, came up with the notion that Jesus was a completely or almost mythological figure. The Gnostic says, if you see it that way, that's okay with us. Then 20th century scholarship re-establishes the historical existence of Jesus. But in many of its activities, such as the currently publicized, greatly publicized Jesus seminars, it tries to prove that virtually everything the New Testament says that he said, he did not say. Again, the Gnostic says, all right. If you see it that way, that's all right with us. So whether we peel the mythological onion or the historical onion, and this may be an ill-smelling metaphor for you, or on the other hand, it might make you cry, or the textual onion, after the last layer is pulled away, what is left? Nothing. <laughs> um, and that is precisely where Gnosis comes in, if it is allowed to come in, that is. That the Jesus of the Gnostics is precisely that intangible mystery that is still there when all the skins have been peeled away. And so here we saw the theologians, beginning with the church fathers, you know, the council fathers and theologians, philosophers, scholars and biblical scholars and so forth, peeling the onion, peeling the onion. But there's something, there is nothing tangible left. And yet there is something still there that is intangible. But the prosaic minded will say, well, there is nothing there. But the Gnostic says, oh, yes, 
The Logos is there. But in what way? Well, not in the ordinary way. There was a very interesting minor English writer, I think sort of uh, uh, late Victorian or Edwardian in terms of times, named Charles Williams. Charles Williams wrote, well, sort of fantasy, what would pass now for fantasy and kind of things. He was also sort of tangentially involved in Golden Dawn and uh, all kinds of magical things like that. And he wrote a very charming little work of fiction called The Greater Trumps. And I'm certainly not here to review this old book, but it's been republished since then. But there's one wonderful little image there that I think is pertinent to what I'm trying to talk about. At a certain point, the uh, protagonist in the book is introduced to a, um, a sort of magical machine by the gypsies. The gypsies have the original tarot in this book. And the original tarot is not a set of cards there, but little sculptures, little figurines. And there is a big round plate, and on this plate, arranged sort of like a mandala, are the, all the little figures that are the uh, tarot cards. And in the center, sort of in the hub of this turning table, is the fool. And so they're gold, little golden figurines, and he stands there, you know, as he sort of snuck into the gypsy's place to see this and all of that, And because the gypsies are by no means happy about it. But he looks at it and looks at it and sees this turn, and see it turn, this, this amazing dance, and as he keeps looking at it, he sees that the fool is not just in the middle, but wherever he looks, the fool is there. And so every figure on the table is the fool. And then he isn't, and then he is, and then he isn't. He is here, he is there, and he's all of them at the same time. And now, that's the kind of uh, thing that we are talking about. This is, well, maybe that's one of the reasons why in a lot of the uh, early scriptures, certainly Gnostic scriptures, Pistis, Sophia, and others, Jesus, the living one. The living one spoke, the living Jesus. These are the Gospel of Thomas starts with those. These are the words which the living Jesus spoke. And Didymus Judas Thomas wrote. Now there are technical reasons perhaps for that, but this is the figure that is alive, that can be everywhere at the same time, that still has that mysterious quality of what Alan Watts, God bless him, wherever he is journeying in a mentor, was one to say, the weird. You know, not just weird, but the weird. And the Alan, one of his saying was, everyone is entitled to his own kind of weird. And he certainly had his own kind. But this is the sort of thing that you find in some of the Nach Hammadi scriptures. Also. I think the Apocryphon of John, and you heard this, many of you have, where the story is told as to how Jesus chooses John and his brothers, the sons of Zebedee, as his disciples. And they are fishermen, and they are out fishing on the lake, probably Lake of Galilee or whatever, and three, three guys sitting in the boat, <laughs> and the three brothers. And one of them looks to the shore and he says, Say, uh, there is a man standing there who is beckoning to us. The other one looks and says, I don't see a man, I see a child. The third one says, I don't see anybody. <laughs> yeah. Now, you see, people repeat a lot of things that they hear and that sound good to them, and maybe they have even an intuitive apprehension as to what they repeat them, but I, you know... Um, all my life I heard people repeat the phrase that how dogmas are bad. If you ask them why dogmas are bad, they can't really tell you. Maybe they would say, well, because they're telling me I should believe something, and nobody's going to tell me what to believe. Well, I sympathize with people who say that nobody's going to tell me anything, because I, ever since I was a small child, I had a great desire for a condition where nobody is going to tell me what to do. And I did try to pursue that path as much as I could. It got me into a lot of trouble, too. But so you say, oh, I, oh, well, you know, I want to be free to believe anything I want to. Yeah, well, do, do you want to believe that you're, um, I don't know, do you want to believe that you have worms in your head? 
you're not really free to believe anything. Because if you believe totally absurd things, you're going to be a nut. You know, you're going to be crazy. So that's not the issue either. So what is the issue? People can't tell you. Let me suggest to you what is really wrong with dogma. What is really wrong with dogma is because it tries to force everyone to see the same thing standing on the shore there, even though you don't see it. You see? And in so doing, it does what? It's not that it takes away your freedom. You know what? I'm a big believer in freedom. You know that. I even wrote about it and everything else. But you know what? When it comes to these deeper things... You are not really all that free. You are not free to uh, turn your face from the truth. If you do that, you're a fool. You're not free. You know? You are not free really. You shouldn't really be free. You shouldn't accord yourself to freedom to fritter your precious life, your precious energy away on nonsense. Whether that nonsense is going after money, or going after power, or going after sex, or going after flying saucers, or going after politics, you are not really free to do that. Because if you do it, you're a fool, and you are wasting a precious opportunity. That's not freedom. But what you have to be free to do is connect yourself with this incredible source of creativity where all these possibilities exist and where the uh, plenum, the um, pleroma, the fullness of possibilities can sort of come forth into conscious manifestation <coughs> through you. That is important. And that is why dogma is counterproductive. Because it takes that possibility, that option away, and reduces everything to a common belief. You, see? you all have to believe this just the way it is. And then you don't see what you are supposed to see calling to you from the seashore anymore. So, see, there is no... no uh, no accuracy in these matters. There is a right direction, however. That's why I said, if you turn your face away from the right direction and you devote your energy to trivialities instead, you are doing something very silly and you are doing something that at some point or the other you are going to regret. But when you are moving in the right direction, then you are, you are moving into a a boundless realm of creative possibilities which all have an enlivening and therefore a transformative effect on you. And you begin to see the, the Lord of the dance here and there and everywhere. The center of the circle is there. But it takes a certain inner eye to see it. And this inner eye is not the vision of faith as conventionally understood. Because such faith is just belief in someone else's belief. And it doesn't really make all that much difference. Whether your belief is, I don't know, St. Augustine's belief or Luther's belief or something like that. Or of some, some crazy fool in Sedona who will tell you uh, what he heard from the flying saucers the previous day and talk to you about the vortices. You know, people actually, I have friends in Sedona who observe these things with detached amusement. You know, people go and sit on certain mountains because they want to sit on the vortex. But it's just a belief, you see. They don't know, they haven't experienced anything. But there's some, uh, uh, I don't know, a former hairdresser with a weird hairdo, I don't know, Gabriel of Sedona, or whatever his name is, you know, as distinguished from the Archangel Gabriel of Palestine, you know, who'll tell you, well, uh, the soul sources were here, and this and that, and the other thing, and so forth. But it's just, it's just a belief. So it's a belief in someone else's belief. Neither is it factual knowledge. Because the facts are few and subject to dispute. 
but rather it is a knowing beyond faith and factual knowledge. It is this kind of knowing, this understanding by way of gnosis that is enjoined upon us in the Gospel according to Thomas. In the 86th Logion, we have Jesus saying, somewhat similar to in Matthew and in Luke, the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head to rest. Assuredly not. We're here again. You see, this is not necessarily a complaint. Everybody has a place in this world, says the teacher. I don't have one. Of course. Because he does not fit anywhere. He doesn't have a place to lay his head because he falls between the cracks. And let me assure you, he falls between the cracks of orthodoxy as much as he falls between the cracks of the new age and all of that. You see? You can't capture somebody like that with terms. Oh, oh karma! Oh, oh reincarnation! You know? You know uh, none of these have any relevance. It doesn't fit these models any more than any other. You see? The Logos is from beyond this world. It doesn't fit anywhere in this world. All throughout the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, we find uncomprehending, confused questions which the disciples address to Jesus, followed by his often ironic answers. For instance, Logion 52. His disciples said to him, 24 prophets spoke in Israel, and they all spoke about thee. I don't know, they either knew more prophets at that time or they multiplied them for effect because I I think that there are only, what's it, 12 minor and 4 major prophets that we know about today. But anyway, 24 prophets spoke, they all spoke about them. He said to them, you have dismissed the living one who is before you and you have spoken about the dead. So this goes very much against, let's say, Schoenfield's thesis. This is not someone who is deliberately fulfilling the prophecies, but rather it is someone who says, don't worry about all of that. You know? Look, I can afford you a living experience because I am the living one. Look at me and don't compare me to the dead. Don't refer to that even. Don't evaluate me in terms of the past, of prophecy, of scripture, of expectation. Look at what and who is before you. And another one, it's the 59th Logion, look upon the living one as long as you live, lest you die, and seek to see him and be unable to see. Now is the opportunity to experience. Don't wait. Or another one, they said to him, Tell us who thou art so we may believe in thee. He said, You test the face of the sky and of the earth, and him who is before your face you have not known, and you do not know how to test this moment. You don't know how to take advantage of what is happening. And finally they ask him, 24th Logion, show us the place where thou art, for it is necessary for us to seek it. And he answers, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Within a man of light there is light, and he lights the whole world. When he does not shine, there is darkness. Now all of this is, what I'm trying to convey is, all of this is most existential, and not at all theoretical. I am the one who, unlike the fox and the bird, has no place in this world. Don't use the measures of the past to evaluate me. Have the experience of my gnosis now before it may be too late, because you may be dead. Look at the light, the man of light. He sheds light, otherwise you are in darkness. Don't hang on to the past or to the expectations of the future. But seek the opportunity now. Take advantage of it. Some of the descriptions given concerning himself are awesome. And as I mentioned before, they don't fit either the theological or the the liberal humanistic categories. Logion 10. This is all Thomas, incidentally. I have cast fire upon the world and see I guard it until the world is a fire. 
Glory on 17, I will give you what eye has not seen, and what ear has not heard, and what hand has not touched, and what has not arisen in the heart of man. Glory on 108, whoever drinks from my mouth shall become as I am, and I myself will become he, and the hidden things shall be revealed to him. Logion 82, whoever is near to me is near to the fire, and whoever is far from me is far from the kingdom. And last, and once again, but not least, I am the light that is above them all. I am the all, the all came forth from me, and the all attained to me. Cleave the wood, I am there, lift up the stone, and you will find me there. None of these are subject to being defined. None of these are subject to being nailed down. And I also suggest that whether you humanize a figure of this sort or whether you dogmatize a figure of this sort and enshrine him in dogma, in either case you are taking away the vital relevance. And... That is, of course, what the mind is constantly trying to do. On the one hand, and we certainly have abundant evidence of that all the time, it was only a month ago or something like that that we spoke about the, uh, the attacks that are being lavished on Carl Jung, for instance, right now, and so forth. There is the constant effort among humans, and some humans more than others, is to tear anybody and anything outstanding down and level it down as low as possible. Somehow, by tearing other people down, people like that feel that they have elevated themselves. But, of course, it's a false feeling. It doesn't work that way. But, of course, behind it, there is also the unconscious or at least pre-recognition. Okay, oh yeah, Carl Jung... Oh my goodness, he was not faithful to his wife. He uh, did this, that, or the other thing, you know. Well, now that we found all that out, now we don't have to concern ourselves with him anymore. We don't have to be challenged by him. We don't have to consider his ideas. He was just another uh, Joel uh, like anybody else, you know, just some kind of a pipe-smoking Swiss. And, oh, that's great. We, you know, because uh, if we have to concern ourselves with this person and the things that he wrote and things that he said, you know, it might make us uncomfortable. And we might have to uh, look at ourselves and we might have to look at our psyche. We might have to deal with the unconscious. And we don't want to do that. It gives you a headache. It makes you late for dinner. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we don't want to do that. And we do that with everybody we possibly can. Oh, no, we find something, we find an Achilles heel, Anna. I don't need to concern myself with this, this guy. I don't need to concern myself with the. I found a fault in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, but maybe you can find something else in it, too. Now, again, you know, we have to be discriminating. Again, It doesn't mean that all that is gold that glitters. It doesn't mean that we have to respect every kind of foolishness. But let's not take the easy way and tear down that which truly challenges us, which might change us. Maybe if we don't do that, we could also still drink from the bubbling spring that has been measured out and thereby become drunk with it and know. And I'm not advocating drinking, and I'm not advocating dope-taking, I'm not advocating anything, but I'm not denying the value of some of these things either for some people. But remember, with your ordinary, so-called rational mind, just confined to that, you are never going to know anything important at all. Oh, you are going to be able to balance your checkbook, you are going to be um, able to take care of a whole number of things. You know what? When the chips are down and you're, um, for one reason or the other, you uh, 
Uh, you begin to recognize that you're not going to be on this earth forever. Your body is falling apart, various things like that. It's not going to be important at all how you balance your checkbook. It's not going to be important at all whether you paid the telephone bill on time. None of these things are going to matter. You'll be there and you say, I lived 60 years, I lived 70 years, or whatever it is, or maybe f- and, and I still don't know anything. I don't know where I came from. I, more importantly, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> you know, I don't know anything important at all. I've been so reasonable, I've been so rational, I've been so sober. And now I stand before the door and I am shaking like a leaf and I am scared and I am miserable because I haven't learned what is important. I haven't learned the truth, the essence of my own being. I have not been confronted with any reality. Oh, I was so reasonable. I tried to be so reasonable. I tried to be so... so. Uh, I tried to fit into the, the picture so nicely. You know what? The picture that you tried to fit into is going away from you. Be there and there's no picture, no society, no family. None of the things that you uh, thought were so important, just you and a uh, great, stupendous mystery, which will remind you, from the time that you came into this world, I was available to you to be discovered. I was available to you to be known with your gnosis, but you haven't done it at all. You didn't pay any attention to it. You went after the the reasonable will of the wisps and the unreasonable will of the wisps, but you didn't take a look at this. Now, I'm preaching here like a like a Baptist, and I'm not getting paid for it like that, and I'm not wearing a $1,500 or $2,000 suit, but I have a pretty colorful necktie on tonight. You, you must admit that. It wouldn't quite wash on, the, uh, on that religious channel, but, you know, it approximates it a little bit. But the reason that I am doing this is because it is my conviction, and more than that, that figures such as that of the founder of the Christian tradition are the living challenge to a change of consciousness, the ongoing challenge to an internal vision and an internal transformation, and they're calling us out from wherever we are. They're calling us out from our exile, wherever that happens to be. You know, now, the drunk is in exile to his booze, but the sober man is in exile to his sobriety. The guy who chases women all the time, or, or men for that matter in our society, uh, you know, and things like that, is in exile to that. But the one who sits there in judgment and says, Oh, adulterers! Oh, homosexuals! Oh, here I am! I am so much better than you are. He is in exile to that. And from this exile, you've been called back. He says, hey, here I am. Who is calling? Hmm? A man? A child? Hmm? Maybe nobody? <laughs> a fool of the tarot card? But somebody is calling. He's calling. And we have to come out of our exile in our own way. We can't come out of our exile in somebody else's way. We have to have a particular vision. Now I'll, I'll tell you a kind of a vision that I had once. Maybe I told you already, but I'm, now that, you know, I'm, I'm not passing myself off as the great visionary. And it's a fantasy. It's a way something appeared to me at one time. But once somehow, sort of without really wanting to do it or anything, it just happened. And I felt I was back in the time of Jesus and I was there among the people, disciples or whatever with him. And I saw everybody interacting and so forth. And there in front of this group of people was the master, was the teacher. And 
First of all, I need that I, I got sort of a total impression of all these people who were there looking at him and talking to each other. They didn't have the foggiest notion who this was. They were totally bewildered. They were so bewildered that it was nobody's business. But they had one thing in common. They knew it was something important. And they said, we are not going to let go of this. If he goes over there, he goes across the river, we'll go after him. Wherever he goes, we're going to go with him. Because we know that we've got something extremely important here, and we're going to find out. Something is going to happen, we're going to find out who it is. And when I looked up there, I couldn't see any human figure at all. I could see a, a whirling light. And the impression came to me, this light is an opening into the other world. This is the door. And so when he said, I am the doorway, knock on me, that's what it is. It's an opening. And through this, through the challenge that this being represents, you'll be able to get out of here. And you'll be able to get to some place very important. And the people had an intuitive grasp, an intuitive recognition of this. Now, we need to have a, a little general, more general conclusion to be drawn from this too. And it is this, that the challenge of the ineffable greatness comes to us in all kinds of ways. And undoubtedly through this person, as through Mani, as through Buddha, as through others, and who knows who is yet to come, the challenge of the greatness has come to people. And we have to be very careful not to chase that challenge away by dogma or by trivialization or by tearing it down and reducing it to some kind of a level where we think that we can dismiss it. We have to be alert to the challenge. You know, the challenge is coming to us to change us. The challenge is coming to measure out the bubbling spring to us so that our consciousness can also change and that we can see the one calling from the shore and take the raft, the yana, as the Buddhists call it, the boat, and row to the other shore. So that is what it is all about. When we respond to the challenge, then we can move into something else. When we don't respond to the challenge, then all we have left is our little cosmos of personality, our little rationality, our little desires, our uh, little uh, ego satisfaction, which all has its place. But when it becomes the all, and there is nothing else, then we are in great trouble. So maybe I was able to present a little... Uh, a little impression as to how this kind of living challenge can work. And if so, then uh, I think we will have a good appreciation of what Christmas and all of these things really stand for, because they are the, uh, the reminders and the documentation of the eternal challenge, challenge to greatness, challenge to transformation, challenge to gnosis, to discovery, and to ultimate freedom. Thank you very much.